Hey there, good evening. Nice to see you. It is time for the Bronx Buzz. This is Bronx Nets program where we talk to reporters and writers and uh, editors and people who put stuff out about the Bronx. Um, this evening's first guest um, is going to talk with us about migration. I, we're going to break it down and talk about migrants in New York. Second segment is about Latino sports. You're going to love what you hear in that segment. But right now, uh, let's uh, talk to an investigative journalist who focuses on immigration. He's a lecturer at NYU, a member of the editorial board of the New York Daily News. It is my pleasure to welcome Felipe De La Hose to our program. Nice to see you, Felipe. Nice to see you, too. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. So uh, this piece that you wrote um, uh, in City and State New York, as I just told you before, and I thought it was the most sensible, smartest piece about migrants in New York that I had read. Uh, the mayor said that this will destroy the city, the migrant um, situation. Um, you had um, a, a more reasoned point of view, a more analytical point of view, um, we can break it down, but why don't you just state what you had seen and what you think could be done? You said it's a logistical problem. Explain what you meant. Sure. I mean, I think that there are a couple of main points that I was really trying to convey here, among them that, you know, the mayor at some point had compared this, you know, he said something like, oh, every mayor has had his, um, you know, crisis and, and you know, Bloomberg had 9-11 and and, uh, you know, de Blasio had COVID. And it really got me thinking about what we're really talking about here in terms of scale and impact. And, you know, I would really posit that those aren't comparable crises, right? In the sense that, you know, the latter two, uh, or sorry, the former two really, really killed, you know, many people. They destroyed, you know, parts of downtown in terms of 9-11 and, you know, retail apocalypse and, you know, economic, you know, recovery from COVID. Whereas, with the migrants, it's not even a particularly unprecedented situation. In the heyday of Ellis Island, and you know, over a century ago, we were getting the volume that we've gotten in the last year, you know, uh, uh, in a month. Uh, and of course, the, the the structures were a little bit different. There wasn't the shelter mandate that we currently have. Uh, but the, I would say that that only, uh, you know, serves to highlight even further that what really makes the difference between our ability to manage this and our ability to not manage it is is policy choices more so than there's any kind of inherent inability to accommodate all these people, particularly as the, the city's population has declined in you know in the last you know uh, you know I I was going to bring that up you you and I when I read it I was like wait a minute he's right um, the city lost about a half million residents um, in the first two years of of COVID I guess that would be after 2020 and certainly we didn't get a million of them back I know many people have left the city they moved out they decided they wanted to go elsewhere. If that's the case, now listen, 100,000 people is a lot of people to just load into the city, but that means the housing <clears throat> probably exists for them somewhere. Sure. And I mean, you know, I think that the way that the numbers get presented are sometimes a little muddy too. Like the 100,000, I think it's 110,000 are arrivals, but many of them have left, right? If you look at the city's estimates, for example, of the number of people that are currently in the city's care, I think it's around 65,000. So we're looking at not quite half, but, you know, a significant portion that have, for whatever reason, left shelter. Some of them, I think, probably have already gained work authorization and reached some level of self-sufficiency. Some of them have left the city. But, uh, and, and we expect, by the way, that Venezuelans will be getting that work or authorization. That's That's come down already. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Sure, with the temporary protected status, which should right. apply to about 10,000 people currently in the city's care, a little bit less than that. But, you know, it, it uh, you know, I'm sympathetic, of course, in, in the piece and in general to, the, you know, the, the Adams administration and, and the Hochul administration to a certain degree, because, the, you know, I don't think they're wrong, per se, that this is really a, a national and to some extent an international issue that is kind of coming down to bear almost exclusively on New York City, right? There are other states and cities that have received uh, large populations of migrants, but nothing, even sorry, even approaching the number of people that have arrived to, to New York. And to their credit, their language thus far has at least alluded to the idea that, you know, of course, we will continue to take care of folks. We're not going to throw folks to the wolves. It's just that it's a it's a significant fiscal issue. And so my my part of my argument, too, is that you know, we're talking about this all wrong, or at least, you know, the framing is is limited in that we have only talked about this as a burden. We have never talked about this really also as an economic opportunity, uh, you know, as a way actually to, you know, 
add a population of people that are very motivated to work right. uh, that, you know, with some policy changes and even just with time, we'll, we'll receive that ability to work that we can train to do, you know, all sorts of things like build affordable housing, right? There's a, there's a, there's mm. a lot of demand in the construction industry. You know, there's the industrial policy of the Biden administration, you know, and in building clean energy, there's all sorts of stuff. Food, that, that food folks, service. Many of these yeah. people, I mean, it, you know, um, I, the other thing or another of the many interesting items in, in your piece, you said that enrollment has dropped in this uh, public schools, by about 114,000 students. So if you just make the assumption that 20,000, maybe a fifth of the uh, migrants who've come in are children, there should be seats in the schools, right? I mean, sure, yeah. Because, and, I mean, you know, know 114,000, there should be some place to put them. Right. And I, you know, I don't want to be glib about the, the particular challenges that the population presents, fair, right? A lot of them very you know, don't speak English and, and, uh, you know, I mean, the, the journey itself is traumatic. And, and you know, anyone who's had a, a conversation with one of these folks can can tell you that, right? Uh, you know, I mean, the mayor was, you know, checking it out for himself recently in the Darien Gap and, and, and all that. But, um, you know, it, there is a, a possibility, particularly I think the children can be assimilated much more quickly, right? They're, they're, they're malleable. They're people who really could become New Yorkers in their own right. And, and you know, I, I want to sort of have us to some extent uh, bring down the separation that, you know, they're, they're kind of just a, sort of an inherently different population. And New York uh, gets, you know, intra, you know, intra national migration all the time. People come from Ohio and, and Minnesota and California and all this, you know, type of uh, uh, stuff. And, and they are able to be sort of accommodated. They add to the economy, you know, yada, yada. I think um, we're, we're missing an opportunity here to really evaluate our, our our sort of ability to integrate and make this sort of a boon for, for the city. Right, rather than say it'll destroy the city. City budget director, um, again, this is from your piece, estimate that it could cost the city $12 billion or more by fiscal year 2025. Um, and this I'm going to quote from your piece. If the Biden administration wrote New York City a check for $5 billion and migrants were able to immediately receive work authorization and leave city shelters, uh, much of the urgency would fade. That's that's your point of view. Um, you, you obviously stick with that. It makes sense to me. Right. I mean, I think, you know, if we really it's a simple sort of hypothetical, but let's say, you know, that 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 billions of dollars were were issued. And, you know, the the editorial board that I'm also part of, we've made this argument many times before, which is that the you know the federal government acted very quickly uh, in, in multiple arenas, you know, to give the city of a financial backstop with with Hurricane, uh, uh, you know, Ida and um <laughs> What's the name it's of okay we would run out of hurricane. i believe me i couldn't keep track either <laughs> <laughs> right, the, the big one i you know it's i'm just like i wanted to say katrina obviously that's not it um it's but okay. you know uh you know believe me if i knew the answer i would have answered it but, I don't know. <laughs> but you know the, the federal government constantly you know like makes the the reasonable evaluation that you know the city's financial health is, is significant and and sort of provides assistance when necessary this is an area where if they simply provided that assistance you know no strings attached to gave, gave the city you know uh even utilize its own existing refugee infrastructure which which is has been practically untouched you know i'm talking about you know coordination with local nonprofits and and sort of the types of assistance that even refugees get which is you know english classes and uh, basic workforce. The, the city has workforce one. That's a, you know, that's right. a, a major program. And so if we were able to just fund those things without straying to the city budget, I mean, this really wouldn't be this kind of like massive, almost existential issue uh, for the city in the way that it's being talked about. I mean, the, the urgency would, would fade. I, I got two questions that were not really, um, because you're an expert, I want to ask you about these two things. Sure. One is um, the cause of the migrant explosion, so to speak. President Trump at that time defunded a lot of the programs that were uh, the federal programs that were in place to help protect people and give them less incentive to have to leave. In other words, they helped uh, protect them legally. They helped deal with domestic violence. And we had those programs. Those programs were ended, seems to me, while um, President Biden, either correctly or incorrectly, is getting a lot of criticism but that germ of a moment was the moment that 
you know, kind of the, the migrants were let loose, so to speak, and say, you know, we got to get out of here because there's no protection. Am I right about thinking in those terms that that's what happened historically uh, to this situation? <clears throat> I think, I mean, there's a there's several factors. I was actually looking at this data yesterday, um, the kind of number of asylum applications filed per month uh, and stretching back to 2017. It's been on an almost uninterrupted upward trajectory apart from, you know, a, a pandemic dip between kind of late 2020 and late 2021 mm -hmm. where it started climbing again and it's kind of, you know, reaching, uh, you know, all-time highs now. But um, that, that increase was present through, you know, the, the Trump administration's many asylum restrictions, through even family separation, through the wall construction, through everything else, uh, even through uh, uh, the bulk of COVID, really. Um, and so, you know, the factors, I think we, we tend to overestimate also the degree to which domestic factors here in the U.S. are really impacting people's decision to, to migrate. But you know, these people are, are leaving their entire lives behind right there. Mm -hmm. It's it's a very, mon, you know, momentous decision. They're, and they're it's dangerous. As can be, danger, right? I mean, you know, if I can, because we're going to run out of time, um, you know, it would be interesting to see what those numbers look like through the Obama administration to see if there was uh, some stability, whatever. Anyway, the last thing before we, we go, I visited a town upstate in upstate New York, a small town. Main Street is dying. The only new stores that are there are, um, frankly, ethnic groceries and other things. Mexicans and Venezuelans have come. If we help build 40 homes or found places for 40 migrant families, couldn't we provide enough workforce development and have those people re-energize Main Street in some of these small towns? Wouldn't that be a good, because many of them would come from rural areas and would not want to deal with our subways here, but would rather live upstate. Sure. And I think, you know, it isn't even necessarily a, um, you know, a hypothetical. We have evidence, for example, Buffalo is a, an example that I point mm -hmm. to often where, you know, they'll credit a lot of elected leadership there and, and sort of, you know, even economists will, will credit the, uh, the arrival of refugees, which is a slightly separate program, but, you know, a lot of refugees in, in Buffalo over the last 10, 15 years with having actually had a massive revitalizing effect economically, right? And so, you know, we, we have plenty of data to point to to say, ultimately, if we actually do this in an intelligent way and provide the bridge, you know, that the people need to go from this kind of destitute position to really contributing to the economy, that they will do so, right? And that they will, That's what you I, know. Yep. Yeah. Listen, yeah. Um, Felipe De La Hose, we're going to call you back because you are a tremendous expert. You have a, a wonderful point of view. I wish somebody in government would hire you and put <laughs> you in place so we can get some of this really done. Um, but uh, thank you and thank the folks at City and State. You can uh, read Felipe uh, De La Hose. Uh, in city and state and all the other publications that he um, participates in. Uh, your work and your words um, this evening are um, vital and we appreciate them. Really appreciate it. Have me on anytime. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, we're going to uh, take a short break. And as I promised at the beginning, uh, Latino sports, they have done some unbelievable stuff. They have grown from the early 90s all the way to now. And um, we're going to talk about that right after this. Much. Fostering a pet for a friend or neighbor can keep families together. Learn more at petsandpeopletogether.org. You can talk to me if you're feeling sad. Thanks for hearing me out, bro. Whenever you need to talk, I'm here, okay? Okay, back with you on the Bronx Buzz, and uh, I'm thrilled because he's one of my friends. He's one of my longtime Bronx friends, but he's doing some amazing stuff about my favorite sport, which is the game of baseball. Uh, my buddy Julio Pabon, he's in Puerto Rico right now. Nice to see you, Julio. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure being with you. And Gary, I know you're a Mets fan. My condolences. <laughs> well, Mets know, and the Yankees. We, we, expected, we expected a lot. I'm not a Met or Yankee fan. I'm a fan of everybody. So, 
Well, you right cover. Now, I'm, I'm, I don't know who I'm rooting for. Um, you know, I watched the playoffs, and then I and, and by the way, folks, we're recording this a little earlier than it's going to air. So if we talk specifics about the, you know the playoffs, uh, it, it's probably going to be uh, you know old news. Uh, I, I just have to mention that play that ended the Braves Phillies game last night was was absolutely oh. uh, insane. That was insane. And what what is um, uh, Bryce Harper doing off the bag that far? That makes no sense. I, did you see it? No, I'm. Oh, you yesterday. didn't. I, oh. I didn't think there was a game yesterday. Was it? There was a game. There there was was one the, game. And the the game ended on an Andy Chavez type catch at the wall, and Harper was off the bag, and they doubled him off the bag from you oh. know deep center field. It was a terrible judgment. How could he do that? They were a run down, and that's that was the play that ended the game. Woo. Wow, yeah. wow. Anyway, Philadelphia has been making so many surprises. That yeah. was a big surprise. That, that was a big mistake. Side. Anyway, listen, let's just talk about Latino sports. Um, you um, sure. you, you created it. I recall we've had a number of discussions about Ruben Sierra being denied the MVP, but it has grown so much. Talk about what it was and what it is right now. Well, you know, 1989, I was vacationing in Puerto Rico. 1990, the uh, results came in about the uh, most valuable player. Uh, in the American League, and um, it was Robin Young. And in 1989, there was no internet, there was no smartphones. Like I could be talking to you right now from Puerto Rico. <laughs> That's right. They didn't, exactly. have that, they didn't have none of that back then. So if you lived like I did all my life, since I moved to New York, since I was, uh, they moved us there when I was four years old. I've always grown up near walking distance to Yankee Stadium. So I'm just basically grew up a Yankee blue, tart, you know, super blue fan. And unfortunately. But me, I didn't know who Ruben Sierra was. And I was in Puerto Rico vacationing in 1990. They had just announced the winners of the MVP. And apparently a lot of people, especially in Puerto Rico, where they follow Puerto Rican players at that time who were not that many, felt that Ruben Sierra should have been the American League most That's valuable right. player. Out of the seven offensive categories, he had led in five. And there was a big hoopla here thinking and waiting for the, you know, big celebration. Well, the Puerto announcement that never came. Yeah, never came. And so, so you decided to do something about it. Exactly. I was a school teacher back then, and I remember seeing a lot of kids coming to school the following days, depending on who, what sports was on the night before. Right. Sometimes I would see African-American kids come into the class because a famous boxer turns or somebody knocks somebody out. And then I've seen some other kids. But I very rarely saw Puerto Rican kids, man, you know, like being like uh, very proud the next day. Uh, and all we saw in the South Bronx was a whole bunch of other people selling drugs, you know, driving around with fancy cars and jewelry and gold teeth. And that's what I thought was the wrong type of imagery that our kids needed to see. So when I heard about Ruben Sierra being a, first of all, he's a black Puerto Rican. He came from the projects. He was a high school dropout. And he had, a, I think, a cousin or a sister or somebody who was, who was a, onto heroin. And I said, damn, those are all the same conditions that I can tell you that a lot but, of But he became a, a, a great player and, and what you thought was an MVP. All, yeah. all those obstacles in his life, you know, going, growing up in the projects, being black, you know, not being a high school graduate, having people in his family that was a dysfunctional family, obviously, because there was somebody on drugs. Right. He overcame all that. And he was like the top player in the American League in 1989. He was denied. That's why I so, thought we so, should give him something. So, so you put together Latino sports. Um, I recall the clubhouse uh, just south of Hostos on 100. That, that came later. That came later. Yeah, I, I understand that. Um, but where we're at now in the game of baseball, and you have covered it, folks, you've got to go to latinosports.com. You've got to do it because they're all over it. I, I don't respond to everything you send me, but I read er and look at everything you send me. Hispanic players are dominating the game of baseball right now. The, the, oh, man, uh, we are, we, we are, we are all, so all, all the great new players. No, I shouldn't say all. We don't want to be exclusive. But so many of the great new players, they all have – Hispanic names. Yeah, no, and the thing is, when we first started, there was only like, you know, a handful. That's why Ruben Sierra. And I decided to do that every year because mm -hmm. I realized that Latino children and all children need to see positive role models. Right. And the more positive role models we see, the better. And unfortunately, Major League Baseball did not, and still at some point, doesn't really promote itself a lot other than through games and, you know, apparel and stuff like that. And I think there's a lot of players there that could be promoted 
So therefore, I came up with the award. It's been 33 years in the making. We celebrated our 33rd year this year. And to our, our great you know, gratitude and surprise, after about 30 years, since two or three years ago, after COVID, uh, Major League Baseball has become the main sponsor. Prior to that, I don't know if you remember, Al Gary, I would have to go around hustling to see who's going to sponsor That's right. so they can but, afford but now, to do something at Giovanni's or do something. But, but, but now, now, now <laughs> you're on the field, and, and I want to show, so let's say you did the two, 2022 yes. MVP awards. We've got pictures. Um, uh, uh, Anderson could put them up there. Um, here you go with Jordan Alvarez, who is as great a player as ever played the game. Uh, and um, there you are. <laughs> There you are on the field. He's dominating now for the Astros in, in the, the yeah, playoffs. Two home runs, the first game, a home run the other day. This guy's awesome. I hope that our award did something about that. It probably motivated him even more. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe, but but I'm sure the players appreciate it as well. Um, uh, oh, Anderson, here, here we go. This, this I love, of course. This is my guy, Edwin uh, Diaz. And uh, you know that I was there that night and saw you on the field yes, uh, from yes, the stands. Yes, yes. Um, but he also, of course, it's a shame what happened to him, but he also, um, you know, became, um, he was great and then became great again, of course, here in New York. And, and we should note he's wearing number 21. That was Roberto Clemente night. And that Clemente meant, day. That's Clemente right. day That's or right. whatever. Yeah. Right. And that meant that that was like a, a, a double win so yes it was, it was it was incredible for us to be there on Roberto Clemente day and mm -hmm. giving uh at the Diaz his award and mm -hmm. being able to go to San Diego having sent somebody to Cleveland sent somebody represented us in uh, yeah, Seattle let, Anderson uh, put them and up there we, we want to see the others yeah go ahead. someone uh represented us in Miami that was Seattle that was our our attorney uh and friend at the um Michelle Davila, she represented us in uh, in Seattle. We had um, uh, Robert, our editor, he went to Cleveland to give Emmanuel Classe his award with the Guardians. And then we had it. The, um, uh, I think you had Manny Machado. Wow. You were in San Diego with oh, Manny Machado. That, that was, that, put, put that way. I think we got a picture. Coast. There you go. <laughs> and you went, you got the yeah. sunny California. But what, what I yeah. love about this, Julio, is that you talked about starting with so-called humble roots, um, you know, things that you did along the way. And here you are now, Major League Baseball is endorsing this across, you know, across the board. And that means that what, you, what you thought about doing with Ruben Sierra is now finally happening. And listen, you can't deny it. If you watch the game of baseball, Hispanic players are, are everywhere. I mean, they're, you know, they're, it, it's vital it's amazing, on every yeah, team. Know. Go ahead. It's amazing the fact that you have, you know, the message here is that, you know, you do something and we wasn't thinking of making money. We wasn't thinking of getting sponsors. We just thought it was something wrong that a, a guy who deserves something, who deserves some recognition should have gotten it. And it, it was it was against obstacles and against, you know, all types of nays, naysayers who say, why are you honoring Ruben Sierra? Because a lot of Yankee fans and my friends didn't know who Ruben Sierra was either, you know? So... We, I went against all of that, and we had an award. And 33 years later, it's become the award. It's become now the most prestigious award given to Latino baseball players in Major League Baseball. The oldest award. It's being considered the Latin Grammy of baseball. Wow. So and I'm sure when these guys get this award, they are they are so awards. happy. Um, the the other thing which makes it really special, and we we just passed by it, but I want to note is this idea of portraits that you. For each award, it's not like you just give them a plaque, but you give them a portrait. And um, we have the pictures of the, um, of, the, of the the portrait makers, so we can put that up. Tell us a little bit about the whole portrait thing. This was Nestor Cortez of the Yankees, of course. Yes. Well, after about uh, 10 years ago, you know, we were we, up to about 10 years ago, we were giving plaques and we were giving trophies. But then I realized that, you know, a lot of these players, they've been getting plaques and trophies since they were in the crib. Literally, I mean, some of these guys have been, you know, playing baseball since they were, you know, like in, in pampers. So giving them a plaque and, and I saw when they got plaques and when I went to other bigger events, uh, I saw how they reacted. They were always appreciative. But I said to myself, what do they do with all those plaques? So they have a trophy room and they put them all up. And I said, they got to be something different. I want, I want to be different. And that's when I met, you know, Fiorentino. That's when I met uh, artists. 
And I started talking about John Panisi, uh, who was one of our first ones. And he said, hey, how about if I do a caricature? And when we gave a caricature and a painting, that saw they their loved. face. Their face was different. I love and, it. And let me tell you, let me tell you how, how, how deep it's gotten. Albert Pujols, they had a day in the life of Albert Pujols. ESPN went to his house mm -hmm. and he showed them his trophy room. And you know, imagine how many trophies and plaques Albert Pujols has. Right? Yes, I can imagine. Silver, and, and, and silver slugger bats and everything. Yeah, of course. And the guy from ESPN called me afterwards. He said, Who, you're not going to believe this. When we were going to his house and we went to his trophy rooms, he was showing us all his trophies and plaques. And then he stopped. There's about six paintings. And he said, of all the awards that I have received, oh, these are my this. favorite ones because this comes from my community. Wow, and Johan Santana, Johan Santana, when he won the Cy Young, he then the following year got our award. And he said, the Daily News quoted this. He says, I had just won the Cy Young, but to win the Latino MVP award and get this is, it means a lot to me because it comes from my community. I, I want to tell you, you did something for for a Jewish boy in the Bronx. You may remember in 2016 when um, <laughs> yes. my boy Jair is familiar one, and we've got. I, I pulled up the picture. I came. I took pictures at the event, and, um, um, and there you go. There's me with um, the familiar, and I was wearing my uh, familiar jersey, and he signed the jersey, and uh, made he me loved, happy. He loved that painting. I tell you, he actually, I mean, this is aside from the award, he taught me something because he had just pitched the day before and he got out of a jam in the ninth inning. And I told him that I was panicked. I said, I said, I was, I thought you were going to blow it. He goes, you did? I wasn't going to blow that day. <laughs> and that just taught me something about how the great players are great. So what's next? we got about 30 seconds. What's next for you? You're just going to well, keep going? Well, bottom line is we're, we're talking to Major League Baseball to go on one step bigger we're trying to see if they want to license. We want to we want to license them the award, the Latino MVP award, so it becomes something solid. Because I've been doing this for 33 years. I'm 71 years old. Uh, I mean, I know how much more guys going to keep me here, but I want this to be you yeah. know continued. And the only way for it to be continued is for maybe Major League Baseball to license the award from us, and that will continuous. We have this for maybe another 33 years. Well, listen, it should go on forever. But you should feel um, comfortable and satisfied because you started something that works, that makes sense. You saw the vision, and that happened. Yes. Listen, um, my friend, you uh, travel safe. Enjoy your time in Puerto Rico. And, um, you know, we'll see you back here in the BX. And we love it. Thank you. Latinosports.com. Dot com. Please visit Latinosports.com. I think you're going to be very well surprised by what you see in terms and what you read at latinosports.com it, it's not just for latinos you don't have to be latino to visit latinosports.com who, who, who are you talking about i mean you know I'm, I'm, <laughs> you know i mean i can't claim to be anything other than who i am uh, julio be well and uh, love to your wife thank and we'll you see so you around much. town all right god bless um, you guys and thank you Great. Bye. We are, we'll see you later. Um, that's it for um, uh, the Bronx Buzz this evening. And uh, what, a, what a treat, of course, to spend time talking baseball. With, and um, what a treat to talk with uh, Julio Pabon. And, uh, you know, if the curtain don't fall and the creek don't rise, we'll see you next week. Good night. <laughs>